Share the screen. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me and can you see the screen? Maybe I don't have my video going. Let me look at that. I don't think I have my video going. Yep, yeah, now we're going. All right, um, hopefully you can see my screen and uh, you can hear me because I didn't get any response. Um, today, what we're going to do is review for the final. The final will be taken sometime from 11.59 p.m. on June 16th, meaning one minute before midnight, till 11.59 p.m on June 16th. And this will be online. Let me see if I can show you that. We should actually get two pages of these. So wait for it to come up. So scroll down here and there will be a few short answer, short essay questions, and that'll be final A, and those will be worth 15 points. And then there will be a multiple choice questions, and that will be on the final that requires Respondus Lockdown Browser. So make sure you take these on June 16th before 11.59 p.m. I trying to remember how many questions there are and I don't remember so let me hmm, I don't always do this stop the share although I probably won't show you the answers but in case I do I'm sh stopping the share and It's not showing me how many questions. Let me edit it. Uh, the uh, final <clears throat> taking the Respondus Lockdown Browser, it is a timed test. So you do have to finish it within the required amount of time. Oh shoot, I don't have the question numbers here. I thought I did. I thought every fifth question was numbered. There it is, question 29, question 30. Question 40. So it looks like about 50 multiple choice questions, roughly. Uh, they're not numbered, so I can't tell you exactly, but around 50. Um, <clears throat> the multiple choice ones are worth 135 points. And let's see how long you have to take it. You have 62 minutes to finish the uh, multiple choice questions. All right, any questions? If not, let's begin the review. Uh, let's come back here, and i got to turn on my screen again. So the final will be heavily testing the chapter since the last quiz. The last quiz covered chapter 8, and lab nine. So there will be heavy questions on chapter 14, chapter 13. Sort of heavy on chapter seven. It was a smaller chapter than the other. That's why I'm saying sort of heavy. 
and then there will be at least one question from every other chapter that we've covered. Let me state up front that uh, chapter one covers a lot of material very briefly that we later covered in later chapters. And so you could argue that chapter one has a few more questions than chapters one through eight. And another reason why chapter one has more questions than chapters one to eight is chapter one talks about the history of microbiology and I really like the history of microbiology. So it's my own bias. There's a few more questions in chapter one than in the other chapters one through eight. Any questions about any of that? Now there will be lab questions in there. Let me see how to say this. Uh, most of the lab questions, or at least half the lab questions, will be involved in your unknown project. So something like you're given some characteristics of cells, and then you try and identify the cells. And I'll give you the table, obviously, to identify it. Uh, so it'll be something like that. There will be a few questions from the lab, but generally not more than one question per lab. The exception might be uh, the first two labs where I ask you general things about the lab, like where you dispose of material. I might have asked a few questions like that, but uh, not very many. Anyways, any questions? All right, if not, let's begin the review. Probably should have uh, downloaded these. This would be a little easier. Come on. Don't know why that got stuck. So as I stated, there will be a few questions on chapter one. Obviously, you should know the terms and you should know the brief history of microbiology. <clears throat> I'm going to the history of microbiology. You should also know about the domains, I guess. That's a pretty important topic, too. Uh, so with the history of microbiology, except for the first one, you do not need to know the dates. Okay? You should know things like who did what. An example would be uh, Leeuwenhoek was the first person to observe microbes, microorganisms, in a microscope. And he did many drawings and descriptions of them. And why he was the first was because he was the best microscope builder of his day. And he saw cells so small they weren't seen for nearly a century, and that was he actually saw bacteria, okay? So you should know things like that. You should know that, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, got a frog in my throat. Uh, Louis Pasteur was the person who disproved the theory of spontaneous generation, and therefore he confirmed the theory of biogenesis. So you should know things like that. Okay, any questions about any of that? That's it for chapter one. For chapter two, maybe I'll go to the study guide. Maybe that'll open a little quicker. If 
for chapter two, you should know about the biological molecules and be able to recognize not necessarily what molecule it is, but you should be able to know what molecule type it is, meaning if I put up a picture of a protein, you would say that is a protein, okay? So you should know the four biological molecules of life, and those are proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. And you should be able to tell me about those molecules, like uh, carbohydrates, we could break them into monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Any question about any of that? Well, if not, that's it for chapter two. Let's talk about chapter three. Chapter three was observing microorganisms. And at the end of the chapter, we discussed about uh, uh, eukaryotic cells. Uh, you should focus in on the prokaryotic cells. Come on. No, it's not gonna go, so we'll just go. You should know the metric system. And I think I have a question about the metric system. So you're given, I don't know, something like the volume of something or the, the weight of something or the length of something. And then I ask you to convert it to another unit of the metric system. So I think there is a question like that. You should know why we should know the metric system. There's really two reasons. You should know the different parts of the microscope and what they do. And you should know the two main types of the electron microscope. All right, let's see if there's anything. Oh, yeah. You should know about stains, why we stain specimens, and the three types of stains. The simple stain, the differential stain, and then the special stains. All right, any questions about chapter three? Can we talk about the gram stain? Yes, we do. All right, in chapter three, you should also know the gram stain. I'm pretty sure I've got at least one question in there about the gram stain. And that's because the gram stain is the most important stain in microbiology. All right. I'm moving quickly through these early lessons because, like I said, most of the questions are not in the material I've already quizzed you on. I notice I've got some email. Hopefully that's not a problem. Chapter four, the anatomy of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. You should know the terms. You should know the concepts that we discussed here and elsewhere, meaning someplace else, like endotoxins, the shape, caucus, bacillus, spirilla, You should know about the endosymbiotic theory and how gram-positive cells and gram-negative cells differ in their cell wall. Any question about any of that? All 
so I'm just looking through to see if there's anything else I want to mention you should know. Well, you should know about movement across membranes. And you should also know that, uh, where is it? Group translocation is a special form of active transport that is only seen in prokaryotic cells. So you should know about group translocation. Oh, let's see. We already mentioned endospores. So this is the second time we ran into them. Did I talk about endospores earlier or did I talk about something else? Uh, you should know about endospores. I'll just word it that way. Um, I don't think I have any questions about eukaryotes except for maybe on the endosymbiotic theory. All right, any questions? Let's not, if no questions, let's move on to chapter five. Metabolism. Well, you should know about aerobic respiration and how it's broken down into uh, uh, glycolysis, the uh, preparatory step in the Krebs cycle, and then electron transport chain. You should also know how much ATP is made at each step of aerobic respiration. And then what the final ATP production is in prokaryotic cells and most eukaryotic cells. By most eukaryotic cells, I'm not talking about the heart, the liver, and the kidneys, in which they have the same amount of ATP as prokaryotic cells. So I don't think I ask you any questions about the heart, the liver, and the kidney. You should know about metabolism and how you can break it down into catabolism and anabolism. You should know about enzymatic reactions. Why is that so big there? Let's see if I can shrink that. That's a little better. You should know the factors that influence enzyme activity. Um, you should know about classifying microorganisms. And then here we go into aerobic respiration. So you do not need to know all of the steps of aerobic respiration, but you should know uh, the uh, three main steps, meaning glycolysis, the preparatory step, and the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. You should know how aerobic respiration differs from anaerobic respiration, and that anaerobes cannot make as much ATP so they tend to grow slower than aerobes. You should know a little bit about fermentation. I'm sort of working ahead of myself here. There we go, this fermentation. I don't think I talk about lipid and protein catabolism. And I don't think I talk about uh, the integration of metabolism, meaning amphibolic pathways. I don't think I talk about that. Oh, you should probably know about uh, cyclic photosynthesis. 
All right. Any questions about Chapter 5? If not, let's move on. Chapter 6. Microbial growth. In this chapter, you should know the terms and know what a psychophile is, a psychotroph, a mesophile, a thermophile, hypothermophile, maybe a halophile. You should know about the oxygen requirements of various microorganisms and how there are, uh, let's see, aerobes, uh, obligate anaerobes, facultative anaerobes, aerotolerant anaerobes, and then microaerophiles. You should know about how bacteria grow. Most of them grow through binary fission, but some reproduce by budding and some by reproductive spores. And you should know how endospores differ from reproductive spores. All right, any questions about any of that? I think there's one topic I want to point out to you. It's near the end. about that. Ah, here it is. The four phases of bacterial growth. Know about the lag phase, the log phase, the stationary phase, and the death or decline phase. Any questions about any of that? Whoops, going the wrong way. I think that's it for this chapter. All right, nobody's asking any questions. Make sure if you have a question to ask it. The next chapter is chapter eight. I do ask a few more questions of that one than questions from chapters two through, I don't know, six. And that's because we spent three days on genetics and uh, it's a longer chapter in your textbook as well so you should know uh, the different way that uh, information can flow in within a cell between cells of different generations and then between cells of the same generation so you should understand about that you should know the terms of this chapter, and you should know about horizontal gene transfer and how it can happen with uh, transformation, conjugation, and uh, transduction. Now, another way that DNA can, can a I don't want to say move around in a population, which is really what it's doing in transformation, conjugation, and transduction. The DNA is moving from one cell into another cell, giving the cell a new genotype. The other way a cell can get a new genotype is through mutation. You should know about the operon and how it controls the expression of genes. I will only ask you questions about the LAC operon. And you should know the different types of mutations. All right, any question on chapter eight?
Now, I went through that very quickly, but remember I mentioned know the terms, meaning there's a lot of information by simply knowing the terms. I guess you should also know a little bit about DNA replication, DNA transcription, or making of RNA, and then protein translation. I sort of forgot that one, which is actually three. But I don't know why that runs in the middle of my lesson. It's been doing that lately. And usually, when I first opened the window, that thing would run. And that was annoying enough. Now it's running in the middle of it, and I just don't like that. And I don't know how to shut it down. If somebody knows how to shut it down, I'll give you an extra credit point. All right, let's move on. Chapter 14. With chapter 14, you need to know the terms because the terms are about half of this chapter. The principles of disease and epidemiology. Also understand the relationship between the normal microbiota and its host. Understand the stages of disease development, meaning diseases usually go through the same stages of development. First there's incubation, then there's a prodromal period, then there's the disease period, and that's when you have the most organisms and you are the sickest. Then there's the recovery phase, and lastly, excuse me, uh, what's the last one called? Ah, oh, gosh, I'm drawing a blank here, just a minute. I'm going to have to look that up. Anyone can mention it, I'll say thank you. Where is that? Knock us down further. them all, incubation, prodromal, period of illness, and then the period of decline. I thought there was one more. Come on. Can't get that page to scroll. Yeah, the period of convalescence. That's the one I was forgetting. Um, so you should know these periods of illness. And most diseases, assuming the patient gets better, go through all of these periods of illness. Sometimes a period will be skipped. And I mentioned that when you get the flu, sometimes you're feeling like no signs and symptoms, and then you move from incubation to the period of illness. There is no mild signs or symptoms. And sometimes the patient dies, in which case we don't have a period of decline or a period of convalescence. All right, any questions about any of that? I can see a few other things that we should talk about. I don't think any of this is I'm going to review. We've already reviewed it in a sense. Um, you should know that the normal microbiota establishes a symbiotic relationship with their host, and that relationship is either mutualism or commensalism. A pathogen or a parasite will also establish a symbiotic relationship with their host. However, that'll be a parasitic relationship where one organism benefits at the expense of the other. And so COVID-19 is a parasitic 
symbiotic relationship with the human population. You should know about Cox postulates. I believe we talked about Cox postulates in three places in the term, and so you should be expecting a question on the final on Cox postulates. Uh, those are the steps you use to show that a given microorganism causes a given disease. I've already mentioned you should know the terms. All right, let's see. Oh, you should know about nosocomial infections. Because those are extremely important if you're going into the health care industry. These are infections a patient gets from the result of staying in a health care facility, such as a hospital and they would not have gotten the nosocomial infection if they had not gone into the healthcare setting. You should know about nosocomial infections and how you can help prevent well, spreading them around. Okay. All right, let's move on. And that would be the terms. All right. Any questions about Chapter 14? If not, let's move on to Chapter 13, Viruses. You should obviously know the terms of this chapter and then how viruses replicate. They take over a host cell and use that cell to replicate the virus. Viruses on their own are not metabolically active. They only are metabolically active when they're inside their host cell and are, have infected that cell and use it to replicate. And you should know that viruses follow different life cycles to replicate. Some viruses follow the lytic life cycle some viruses follow the lysinogenic life cycle. And these are the two life cycles that bacteriophages have. Now, animal viruses have the lytic life cycle, and they have the budding life cycle, and they have the latent and persistent infection life cycle. And I don't think we've much talked about the persistent infection, but uh, we did talk about how a virus can stop causing disease, and really it stops replicating and stops being metabolically active, and it just sits around and goes into latency. And that we call the latent life cycle. Uh, the best example is the chickenpox virus. When a child has chickenpox, the virus is actively replicating and is in the budding life cycle when it is replicating and when it's causing disease in the child. But then it leaves the budding life cycle and goes into latency and the virus just stays dormant for perhaps a long period of time. And then the virus comes out of latency and re-enters the budding life cycle, causing disease, which we call not chickenpox, but shingles. Every other time somebody gets a disease caused by the chickenpox virus, only the first time does it give signs and symptoms of chickenpox. All later times, it'll give signs and symptoms of shingles. Uh, 
let's see, we talked about animal viruses. We should also know about prions and viroids and how prions can cause disease in humans. I guess I never mentioned that. When Great Britain had their epidemic of mad cow disease, there were two other populations that came down with prion disease. Presumably from eating prion contaminated beef. And those two species were humans and domestic cats, meaning kitty cats. Close to 150 people in Britain came down with prion disease, probably from eating contaminated prion beef. And close to 150 British cats came down with prion disease. And that's just something for your own information. I'm not going to quiz you on that, but I just thought you would be interested in knowing it. Surprisingly, dogs, which eat pretty much the same food as cats, did not come down with prion disease. So they must be more resistant to getting prion disease than people or cats when they are eating contaminated beef. You should understand the characteristics, the structure, and the classification of viruses. And you should know that viruses are classified on their common English name. Viruses do not have Latinized names. The common English name, like the polio virus, is used worldwide. All right, any question about chapter 13? If not, let me quickly go through it to make sure I've covered everything. Oh, you should know about the uh, host range of viruses and why they have a host range. Oh, here's something. Uh, you should know that animal viruses, generally, if they're RNA animal viruses, they replicate in the cytoplasm of cells. There is one exception, and that's retroviruses replicate in the nucleus. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that in just a bit. Uh, DNA animal viruses, on the other hand, generally replicate in the nucleus for animal viruses. Now, bacterial viruses, meaning bacteriophages, can only replicate in the cytoplasm because that's all there is in a bacteria. Uh, you should know how a budding virus obtains its envelope. I did mention about budding viruses, but let me state, you should understand how a budding virus obtains its envelope. All right, you should know a little bit about retroviruses because they're a little different RNA virus. They contain the enzyme reverse transcriptase, and reverse transcriptase uh, copies the RNA and makes it into DNA. And then it makes the single-strand DNA, double-strand DNA. And that allows the DNA to integrate into the host genome 
and that is the life cycle of retroviruses, where the DNA integrates into the life cycle, or into the DNA of the host cell, and then the virus will make RNA copies when it is replicating. And this virus follows the budding life cycle. Or I should say this family of viruses follows the budding life cycle. You should know about coronaviruses. We did talk about that for something like three or four slides. And you should particularly know about COVID-19 because it is a current pandemic in the world. that to here there oh well uh, you should know about viruses are associated with human cancer and there's two ways that viruses can cause cancer they can have uh, their viral DNA integrate into the host DNA forming a provirus and that can mutate the host cell's DNA, or at least interrupt the host cell's DNA, which can give rise to cancer. And then some viruses contain an oncogene. An oncogene is a mutated form of a normular cellular gene involved in cell growth. And so this oncogene, when it gets in a cell, causes that cell to grow uncontrollably. And that is one of the characteristics of cancer, uncontrolled growth. We've already talked about that. And we talked briefly about prions and uh, viroids. Okay, that's it for the chapter. Any questions about chapter 13? If not, let's move on to chapter 14. Did I already do chapter 14? Yep, I did. All right, so let's move on to chapter 7. So in chapter 7, you should know the terms. You should be able to discuss the factors that influence microbial death rates. You should be able to discuss the main three ways in which antimicrobial agents kill or inhibit cells. And I'll go ahead and list those three ways now. You can damage or denature DNA. You can disrupt or damage the membranes, like the cell membrane. And you can damage or mutate the DNA. So those are the three ways that antimicrobial agents kill or inhibit cells. You should understand the various types of disinfectants. And now I don't ask you how they work. And you should understand the relative resistance of the major microbial groups to antimicrobial agents. For example, gram positives are more sensitive to antimicrobial agents than gram negatives. And the reason for this is the gram negatives have an outer cell membrane on their cell wall that helps protect the gram negative cells from, well, let's say our treatment. Okay? Any questions about any of that? I already mentioned you should know the terms. You should know that cells die at a constant log rate, meaning the more time you expose the cells to the treatment, the more cells that will die, and it's constant on a log scale. The death rate is constant. 
already mentioned that one. already mentioned that one. You should know the physical methods for controlling microbial growth. Such as dry heat, wet heat. Radiation. Filtration. Low temperature, which doesn't really kill cells, uh, it mostly inhibits the cell growth. And I guess it depends what cell we're talking about, like uh, Neisseria gonorrhea will die at low temperatures, but uh, Staphylococcus aureus will not. So it depends what species we're talking about. But it will slow, at least slow, the metabolic activity of the cells and uh, low temperature could keep them, well, generally keeps them from growing, at least a mesophile. A high pressure can be used to control microbial growth, and we use that on things like juice, so that the juice color, flavor, and nutritional value is preserved. A filtration would be the same in that regard. Uh, desiccation, where you dry things out, and the best example of that is dried fruit. It can last longer than a year. And then I mentioned radiation. You should know a little bit about ionizing radiation. Boy, that got covered here. That should be ionizing radiation. Creating ions, which can damage cells. And then the other way, non-ionizing radiation, meaning ultraviolet light, where the UV light causes thymine dimers, which inhibit DNA replication and DNA transcription. You should know the chemical methods of microbial control As you know, the factors related to effective disinfection, I think I already talked about this. Um, I think I talked about it in the very first slide. I do ask one question about uh, what this agent, uh, which is fairly common, what type of uh, chemical agent is it for using as a disinfectant or antimicrobial? I think there is one question like that. All right, we talked about this. All right, any questions about chapter 14? If not, that's it. I'm not going to review the labs. For the labs, you should look through the major terms of each lab. Uh, I don't ask too many lab questions. Like I said, the only lab questions I can remember are, are things related to lab one and two, or I should say lab zero, zero, and lab one. So safety and where to dispose of materials in the lab. All right, any questions? Uh, hi, I actually have questions for the lab. Uh-huh. I actually have questions for the lab. Okay, why don't I end this, this meeting, and then we will talk about your question. Unless your question is a general question. Is it a general uh, question that may be um, useful to other people? I actually am not sure, but it's more of a personal question, I guess. Okay, then I'll stop this, and uh, we will continue with your question.